The following program presents principles designed to promote good health. It should not take the place of personal professional care. Viewers should always consult their qualified health practitioner before considering alternative treatment. is not working well. Dr Kellogg said three intakes of food a day should equal three evacuations a day. Now that is a surprise to most people. Yep. Most people think if they go once a day, they're doing well. So one of the biggest loads on the liver is, is if the colon's not working well. Now the colon has a mind of its own. Have you noticed if you've got diarrhea and you tell it to stop, it won't? And if you've got constipation and you tell it to go, it won't. The colon needs gentle stimulation. So let me just show you here what stimulates the colon. Not irritation, but stimulation. And I'll, I'll spend a few minutes on this because this is a very common problem. So gentle stimulation, what stimulates the colon is exercise. And one of the exercises that is the most stimulating and massaging to the colon is Pilates type exercises. And I, you might have remembered me saying earlier in the week, we should really be doing some sort of Pilates workout, say 10 minutes three times a week, just to strengthen that core. So exercise stimulates the colon, water stimulates the colon. And we should be having approximately two liters a day that's over the day, sip, 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 and with that two litres, a crystal of Celtic salt or Himalayan salt, every glass. And as I showed you in an earlier meeting, that just allows the, each cell to access that water. What also stimulates the colon, so we're looking at what stimulates colon, what stimulates the colon is laughter. No wonder the proverb says, a merry heart doeth good like a medicine, but a broken spirit dries up the bones. Do you know children laugh 125 times a day? And if they don't, it's probably because they're on too much wheat and too much gluten and not drinking enough water and getting to bed too late. <laughs> we should laugh more. Laughter relaxes the colon. What also stimulates the colon is fibre. And I'm not talking about wheat germ or wheat bran or rice bran. I don't advise eating any of those. The highest fibre food is your vegetables. We should be eating a lot of vegetables. We had a wonderful breakfast this morning. We're staying in a lovely house that's got a garden and we picked about this much spinach. I had to cook it in two saucepans for four of us. <laughs> we had brown lentils that were well rinsed and nicely flavoured with herbs and oil and salt, a big pile of spinach each, and corn each, cob of corn that we got fresh, and some nuts. See, that's a breakfast, very high in fibre. Everything had fibre. Great proteins in your legumes and your nuts. Fats, where are your fats? Uh, I put oil in the lentils before I served it and I poured oil, olive oil and salt on my spinach. Actually, I think it was silver beet, was it? Spinach, on my spinach, it was English spinach. I poured some olive oil and some Celtic salt on my corn. That is high fiber, takes you a long time. Great proteins, good fats. So the highest fiber food is your vegetables. No limit on vegetables. We should be eating a lot of vegetables every day. Some raw and some cooked. And very important with the colon is to listen. We should promptly answer nature's immediate call. Got that? So many people don't go when the body says to go and then the body gets into a habit. 
every cell in our body has memory and every cell in our body has habit just as much as our brain has memory and our brain has habit. So very important to adhere to all of those so that the colon works regularly. That's one of the best things you can do for your liver because when the colon's not working well, waste is coming off, toxic waste as it sits in the body and then the liver, everything goes to the liver. Now the herbs that stimulate healing in the liver, so these are your liver herbs. And remember, sweet to the mouth, bitter to the liver. Bitter to the mouth, sweet to the liver. All your bitter herbs, so that's dandelion. And that can be taken fresh or as a dried herb, St Mary's thistle. And you can also get another herb which is very bitter, it's called gentian. And the sweet bitter is ginger. And globe artichoke is another well-known liver herb. The liver's a recoverable organ, so once you get the colon moving well, which it should, with exercise and fibre, relaxing, and give it the, uh, the herbs, the, the liver will recover. I'll leave that for a few minutes. So that's how you can strengthen your, your liver. And we have another question here. With your experience, what is the immediate emergency treatment for stroke? and for people who live in remote areas especially. Now if you were present at the Poultis lecture last night, you would have heard the story on cayenne pepper. Cayenne pepper is just the best. If someone has a stroke, just put it straight in their mouth. Don't bother measuring it, just as much as you can get in. And you know the, la the story of the lady I told you about, who I'd put a half a teaspoon of cayenne pepper in her mouth when she had a stroke. I must have got there within a few minutes. We asked her lady, later, was it hot? And she didn't even notice. <laughs> and remember, it takes one minute for one drop of blood to go around your whole body. So really, the cayenne pepper um, is the best for stroke. So have it in your bag. I always travel with my cayenne pepper. I actually gave it away last night to a man in great need. <laughs> but I'm sure I'll last a few days without my cayenne pepper. So in remote areas, absolutely. And one of the reasons I came at all these natural ways of healing is because we lived very remote. We lived uh, way up in the hills, an hour from town, and that was through creeks and up mountains in dirt roads. So it's very handy to have these things up your sleeve. Any recommended natural remedies for acne, for pimples? Um, Apart from lifestyle, diet, exercise, lots of water, absolutely. Uh, acne is often an indication of a hormonal imbalance. And a hormonal imbalance can come from plastics, can come from chemicals, can come from the contraceptive pill. If a woman's on the pill for several years before she gives birth to her children, that can uh, cause an imbalance in their hormones. So they, they can have uh, uh, acne, uh, things like that. Some of the symptoms of a hormonal imbalance are migraines at period time, um, premenstrual tension, very heavy periods, very painful periods, um, acne also around that time. Sometimes I have people come to my health retreat, I say, do you get headaches? And they say, migraines. When did they start? Oh, when I was about 13 and nearly every time you can actually put it with when they began uh, menstruation. And I've met 50 year old women and that link has never been connected. So how do we balance the hormones? You can put Barbara O'Neill into the YouTube hormones and there is a lecture on hormones. Um, if I am asked to come back in a year's time say, I can do a whole nother series of subjects and maybe if I come back I'll do a whole lot on hormones. But you can see the information on, uh, on YouTube and my set of DVDs also has, has one in there. Um, 
and it looks at the reasons for the imbalance. But in a nutshell, um, the Anna's Wild Yam Cream is a cream that helps to balance the hormones. I do know there is a place in New Zealand you can get the Anna's Wild Yam Cream, and there is a lady here who can give me that information. So in the break, I'll write it up there, okay? Okay, next one. What is leaky gut? Is this true? It is true. Now, the, a couple of times this week, I've drawn the lining of the gastrointestinal tract. Looks like that. And it has a thick turf wall. Do you remember what that's made out of? Lactobacillus acidophilus bifidus bacterium. It's a thick mucosa wall. And when that wall starts to break down, basically that's leaky gut because that thick mucosa wall has four functions. One is it's the responsible for the final breakdown of the food. It's also responsible for the absorption of the food. This gut flora is responsible for protecting the blood against any harmful pathogens and it nourishes the little cells that line the gastrointestinal tract. The little cells that line the gastrointestinal tract, they're basically made down here, they travel up and every three to five days away they go. So every three to five days the cells that line the gastrointestinal tract are remade. So if that gut lining breaks down. What would break it down? Uh, antibiotics, uh, the contraceptive pill, statin drugs, uh, cortisone, um, ibuprofen, which is uh, neurofen, the painkillers. Now we've got a leak. You see that? There's your leaky gut. And Here's the blood in here. So here's the gastrointestinal tract. The food's coming down, it gets broken down, and then it comes in to get through and into the blood. So how do you heal that? Number one, there are three foods that are like kerosene to a fire in here, and that is the hybridized wheat and dairy and refined sugar. Now there's something else, and with some people that aren't responding, this is what you question. Is there any exposure to mold? Is there any exposure to chemicals? And is there any exposure to heavy metals? Now how mold can exasperate the problem, when mold gets into the gut, it causes a, a growth of the candida. You've heard of candida? Candida albicans. There are dozens of different species of candida albicans. So you put that on top of the fact that the antibiotics have killed off the good bacteria, another reason why candida can get out of control. The body runs according to precision balance, though this is actually throwing out the balance. Number two, Probiotic, and this should be taken three quarters of an hour before breakfast. Three quarters of an hour before breakfast, you take a probiotic supplement. And that allows the probiotic to go way, 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 way down to where you want it. If you take a probiotic with your meal, the hydrochloric acid can wipe it out because hydrochloric acid, in fact, in my book, I call it the stomach secret weapon. You see, hydrochloric acid kills off any harmful microbes and it is also connects with pepsinogen to produce pepsin, which breaks down protein. So probiotics important. Number three, and we've looked at this a couple of times, there are two herbs that coat, soothe and heal the lining of the gut. One is aloe vera and the other one is slippery elm. And I think I told you about the man from Kenya, that uh, by the end of the week, his 
ulcerative colitis had calmed right down, no more bleeding from the bowel, no more pain in a couple of days, bowel movements calmed right down, and that was the slippery on four times a day. Now I'm about to give you something else, and this is a mix that we make at our health retreat, and for very severe cases I do this, and I did it for him. I call it digest powder. And digest powder, you can make it yourself by just getting the herbs. If We do sell it, but I know it's difficult to get herbs into New Zealand. So it's 80, say eight part slippery elm. And that's the coat soothe lining healing. One part myrrh. Myrrh is a gum resin and myrrh is a strong antimicrobial and healer. One part, golden seal. Golden seal is king of tonics to all mucous membranes. So if someone has quite a serious problem, then I give them that mix. Now the dose, you put that all together in a jar and they all must be powdered. The dose is one teaspoon to about half a cup of warm water. Now if someone's serious, let's say someone's going to the toilet 10 times a day, I would give them that four times a day, before each meal and before bed. As it all settles down, they might have it just in the morning and just before bed. And when the colon is now perfectly well and there's no problem, you stop. And then maybe six months down the track, not drinking enough water, slipped a bit of this food in, stayed in a motel room and discovered that the carpet was mouldy, can you see, etc., etc. <laughs> and it starts up again, what do you do? You go back to the nursery. And Dr. Natasha Campbell McBride, in her book, when she gets someone with se severe colon problems, she just puts them on thick soup, that's it, thick soup. Thick vegetable soup, that four times a day. And remember, the cells that line the gastrointestinal tract, they remit every three to five days. So you should be getting results quite quickly. If you're not, you put the detective hat on and see if there's any exposure to these three. Your best guide is your body's response. You see that? You adjust accordingly. So that's Liggy Gut. <laughs> if I'm rubbing things off, you're still writing, just yell out stop. And I'll stop. So next question. Does cooking release the inside value of flax seeds? Is grinding them ideal? Does cooking release the inside value of flax seeds? Cooking destroys it. Um, what flaxseed does, and I'll do this as simple as possible, this is the molecular structure of flaxseed. There's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. There's 18 little links in omega-3, which flaxseed's high in. And it's high in omega-3. The three means that one, two, three, the third link, there's two bonds, one, two, three. There's another bond there, one, two, three. There's another bond there. Now, these ones that don't have the bond, they have hydrogen atoms on them, which protects them. So with omega-3, you've got three gaps there, and those three gaps attract the light, they attract the heat, and they attract the oxygen. So I tell you this to show you that if you grind flaxseed and, so, and it's exposed to light, heat and oxygen. The light, heat and oxygen are attracted into these spots, sorry, that should be three, and they're all destroyed. 
So flaxseed should be taken raw and flaxseed should be ground just before you eat it. Now a lot of people choose to use chia. Chia is not as high in omega-3 but it's fairly high because you can just soak it in a little water or a little juice or a little coconut cream or something like that. It'll gel in about five minutes and you can put that on your breakfast. The chia seed apparently absorbs nearly 25% its own weight in water. So the reason why you shouldn't put flaxseed in cooking or anything is because those empty bonds are extracted to light, heat and oxygen. But there is another way you can use the flaxseed that is a remedy for constipation. And that is using the whole flaxseed and you do pour boiling water on it, but you are not uh, destroying the light, heat and oxygen because it's still got that seal on it. But when you pour boiling water on it, it gels. So maybe that's what the question means. Uh, a substance is released that gels it. And then the remedy is you put a squeeze of, uh, no, a juice of an orange on and mix that and you drink it before you go to bed. And all those little whole flax seeds with their gel around them basically act like a broom and so in the morning often you, you can, uh, your bowels will open. Is that clear? If it's not, please tell me and I'll explain it again. What is a natural source of iodine. Um, iodine is in the sea and when the waves pound against the shore, iodine is released into the air as a gas and it travels over the land and settles in the soil. And so foods that are grown near the sea are higher in iodine and a lot of people that have thyroid problems are found right in the middle of countries where they're not eating foods grown on the coasts and the soils are low in iodine. So just about any food has iodine in it if it's grown near near the coast. Uh, what about seaweed? Seaweed does have iodine. Uh, what about Celtic salt? It has a little bit of iodine. But one of the reasons why people get low, uh, low iodine, thus thyroid problems, is because of a few reasons. And one of the reasons is that high estrogen opposes thyroid function. How do you get high estrogen? Well, the pill causes high estrogen. Uh, plastics have a pretend estrogen in or pseudo estrogen that can get it up. Uh, chemicals can get estrogen up. And high estrogen opposes thyroid function. Uh, mercury fillings in the mouth have an affinity for selenium. And your thyroid gland needs selenium to convert iodine into thyroxin. There's more. Uh, Bromide is a component of um, many herbicides, insecticides, especially on berries. Now, if a person is having, and isn't this a popular one, frozen berries, green smoothie, put the frozen berries in, say they're having frozen berries every morning, bit of an overload, um, they'll get an overload of bromide. Now, bromide competes with iodine in the body. So can you see that people can be lacking iodine because they've been on the pill and they're eating too many plastics because uh, they've got mercury fillings in their mouth and how many people want to get away from the carbs and they have tuna and salad for lunch every day? And tuna can be high in mercury, again gobbling up the selenium. So can you see it's not a simple, <laughs> not a simple answer. So. In this day and age that we live in, we are subjected to so many environmental poisons. It's a good idea to do an iodine test, which I mentioned last night. You can buy Lugal's solution from the chemist. And Lugal's solution has um, iodine and iodide. And there are different organs of the body that use iodine or iodide. So it's a nice form. <clears throat> Put it on your skin. There'll be a like a brown smudge and you just observe how long it stays there. 
It should still be there probably a little faintly by about five hours. But we've had some guests that's gone in half an hour. Now that's an indication they have low iodine because if you've got low iodine and you'll paint iodine in your, on your skin, your body will grab it very quickly. Now if you would like to understand the fats a little bit more, I have a whole lecture on fats that you can look in my DVDs or you can go to YouTube which will compare all the fats and put that in detail. I just touched on it there to show you why once you open the linseed it must be eaten within an hour or frozen. What is the best solution to combat Water retention. There were a couple of questions on this. Um, swelling of the legs. Believe it or not, the swelling in the legs means that your, your kidneys, your kidneys are what balance the sodium and the water levels in your body. So it's an indication that the kidneys aren't very happy. So what you can do is you can increase your water intake and salt intake. One lady said, more water, but look, I've got too much now. Now, when the legs swell, do you know what that means? The water's not getting inside the cell. It's on the outside of the cell. And our cell has a bilayered membrane around it. And water cannot get in unless magnesium is there. Magnesium will pull the water inside the cell. And that's why a crystal of whole salt on your tongue before every glass of water, it gets the water into the cells, the quickest way to hydrate a body. Now we do lose two litres, sometimes two and a half litres a day. Two litres must be replaced. And the best way for someone to take that, especially someone with swollen legs, is to sip it. That means that if they're swollen legs, their kidneys are struggling a little bit. So the water must be just sipped. A mouthful here, five minutes later, another couple of mouthfuls. And at the beginning of every glass, have that crystal of Celtic salt, and that will get the water inside the cell. Now, we had a lady come and do our program about a month ago, and she had big swelling in her legs, and they picked up her kidneys weren't functioning properly. She had blood, high blood pressure. She's, um, I think she's uh, about 58, and they wanted to put her on dialysis. Her sister pushed for her to come to our health retreat. She rang me the night before she was booked in. She said, I'm concerned about coming to your health retreat. She said, I'm concerned at the detox. I'm going to release too many toxins. It's going to put a load on my liver and I'm going to get worse. Granted. And I said, I understand your concerns, but I want you to know that we watch you carefully and we'll adapt and adjust at every single step. She said, OK. Now, I remember lying in bed early that morning thinking, hmm, kidneys. Now, we do use herbs, but we only really have the herbs that we go through a lot, and we don't have a lot of people with kidney problems. Now, my celery was going to seed, and celery is an excellent kidney herb. Here are the kidney herbs. So celery and my parsley is also going to seed, and parsley is another excellent kidney herb. And I have lots of cooch grass. And cooch grass is another excellent herb. So I picked all of those, and we got her to drink a liter of that tea every day, and the legs went down. <laughs> now I'll give you a few others. Corn silk. Corn silk, using the corn silk, you can buy dried corn silk or you can uh, use the corn silk, ideally out of organic, organic, uh, organically grown, so you haven't got the herbicides and insecticides. Yes. Uh, the, another part of the body can be swollen, but uh, if it's stomach swelling, it's often to do with digestion. Now this lady. I was so excited because all her legs went back to normal. She went home, she changed the diet to what you've been hearing this week. 
I found out too that she had quite a strong gluten intolerance, so that stopped. If someone's eating wheat and they are gluten intolerant, that puts a huge load on the liver. It puts a huge load on the kidneys because they have to deal with the toxic waste because the body can't break it down. Well, she just emailed me. This is a month later. She said, fantastic news. She said, all my levels are back to normal. She said, my kidneys are functioning normally. One month. She's about to go on dialysis. She said, my liver function test is normal. She said, it's never been normal. She was so excited. I said to her, I guess junk food has no attraction for you now. She said, none. <laughs> If you give the body the right conditions, you will get the results. So um, swelling in the stomach area, um, often called bloating, it's often to do with, with digestion. Uh, this lady asks, uh, can we have an email group? But if you email me questions, it's there. I think that's mostly what that is about. There were a lot of, ah, there they are there. Liquid chlorophyll. Any need to take this as a routine supplement? I don't take liquid chlorophyll, but I have lots of green leafy vegetables every single day. I had a huge amount this morning in my spinach. Now someone might take liquid chlorophyll or green barley or wheatgrass or spirulina if they're not well. It's excellent to detoxify from uh, mould. The reason why it's so good with mould is mould is acid and it's alkaline. Chemicals, so chlorophyll is one of the most potent blood and tissue chemicals, or sorry, let me start again. Green barley or liquid chlorophyll is one of the most potent blood and tissue cleansers there is. So it cleanses the tissues and also uh, heavy metals. So if someone is detoxing from either of these, I would advise taking the chlorophyll or the green barley or some form uh, three or four times a day. So it depends on what the problem is. It says here, should I take super greens plus, which has green barley, wheatgrass, alfalfa, spirulina, kelp, sounds fine, <laughs> sounds good. Ionic minerals. No need to take ionic minerals. The best way to take minerals is the way they're found in nature. If you take minerals the f way they're found in nature, do you know they get through that membrane wall because there's an electric electrical potential around every cell and that electrical potential is basically the same as you find in seawater. You just think of seawater, the rain comes down, it washes minerals out of the land into the little creeks and rivers and they all end up in the sea and what's the taste of the water by the time they get to there? It's salty. In fact, Dr. Robert Thompson, he says the clearest indication to him of a creator God is seawater. Because seawater is the exact same mineral balance and proportion as you'll find in the body. In fact, if anyone's on calcium supplements, don't take them. Let me show you why. So I'm putting myself a question in here now. Should I take calcium supplements? The answer is a resounding no, because bones are not made of calcium. Did you know that? Let me show you what bones are made of. They're made of 12 minerals, which is boron, calcium, chromium. You know chromium helps get those blood sugars right. And iron and magnesium and manganese and potassium and phosphorus and selenium and sulfur and silica and zinc. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. There's your 12 minerals. That's what your bones are made up of and 64 trace 
minerals. <laughs> so with that sort of information, students, what do our bones need? Not calcium supplements. When you take calcium supplements into your body, you get an overload of calcium, the body goes, whoa, and it shuts down the adrenal glands to hold on to magnesium to try and get the balance. And the effect of that is to cause the kidneys to release potassium and sodium. You get this huge imbalance. What is the best way to strengthen your bones? Take the minerals that your bones are made up of. How do we find that? Where do you find it in the most perfect proportion? Students? Seawater. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm not suggesting you go and drink seawater. All you need to do is take the two salts that have the minerals in their right balance, which is Celtic salt and Himalayan salt. Mm-hmm. How much do you take? I take a crystal every glass of water and I generously sprinkle it, sprinkle it on my food. If you're not used to salt, go lightly. If, you're, if you've been on a no salt diet, I would have a very tiny crystal twice a day. <laughs> After a couple of days, three times a day. You've got to ease your body back into it. Yes? A little bit. A little bit. If you have a crystal of Celtic salt with every glass of water today, all you've done is replace the minerals you lost yesterday. There is another place that you will get minerals in this proportion, and it's dark, green, leafy vegetables. Every day we should have them. I had a huge feed this morning because I knew I'm going to be flying this afternoon. <laughs> I'm going to be traveling, and I gave myself a very good dose. Oh, that's so much cheaper than calcium supplements, isn't it? And let me tell you one more thing. We have, oh, a percentage of our guests are nurses that work in aged care. And they said in aged care, every patient has a big calcium supplement tablet they have to take every day. And I said, how many of them have osteoporosis? What's the answer? All of them. Is it working? No. And what's the definition of insanity? So the money you save on stopping your calcium supplements, you can buy organic greens, good salts. Question? What do I class as green leafy vegetables? Really anything green, leafy and edible. Broccoli, uh, kale, uh, spinach, silver beet. We're coming into winter, so um, your winter greens are your coriander, and coriander is a metal chelator. And um, what's the other one that we use a bit of? Ba um, yeah, your cabbage. Basil is your summer green and coriander your winter green. Rocket. Rocket. So now's the time to put your rocket and your coriander seedlings in. What about taro leaves? What about taro leaves? They are very high in minerals. Remember, your minerals are not lost when you cook. So cooking of the greens, you've still got your minerals. Asian vegetables, absolutely. Now, if you want to pursue this subject a little bit more, Dr. Robert Thompson, excellent book. He's an American, you can find it. It's called The Calcium Lie. I've just given you, in a nutshell, but he, you, he'll pursue it a little bit more for you. Yeah? Um, my daughter and family has been recommended to take calcium because in our family we are, suffer from heavy bleeding. And yep. I recommend they drink soya instead of cow. Yep. And slowly get into their head. 
Now, the reason your family have a history of heavy bleeding is because of a hormonal imbalance. So if the hormones are balanced, the heavy bleeding will stop. And let me show you blood. This is the molecular structure of human blood. And the middle molecule is iron. Here is the molecular structure of chlorophyll, which is plant blood. The middle molecule is magnesium. They're almost identical. So don't drink soy milk, drink greens. Mm -hmm. Isn't that interesting? You want a blood transfusion? Have a, have a green drink. <laughs> green smoothies have become popular. Some people say, well, can you put greens with fruit? Well, greens are considered leaves, so they're considered herbs. So they basically can go with fruit or they can go with vegetables. It says, ionic minerals. Is there a large benefit from this product? No. No. The ionic minerals are not as good as just that Celtic salt. Isn't it good that it can be this cheap? And when you save a lot of money from doing this, you just put the things you save in a little jar and come to Misty Mountain. <laughs> now, I see... Uh, let's have a break now. I have some more questions there and we'll come back at... Um, it's almost five to three, so we'll come back at quarter past three, and then we'll have another quarters, three quarters of an hour to answer questions. Um, there's some drinks out the back, and Amelia's nearly out the back with, um, with the books. Oh, and one more thing. The book I mentioned yesterday that I gave that beautiful quote called Steps to Christ, there's a whole pile of them on the front here, and feel free to take one. 